Local stories, local people. We're taking you inside Western Mass News. It's the Even Better Western Mass Podcast with Dave Madsen. Welcome to this week's edition of the Even Better Western Mass Podcast. Hope you're doing well as here we are in the middle of September already. Well, this week we're focusing on systemic racism. Racial unrest has gripped the entire country since the death of George Floyd, killed during an arrest by Minnesota police a few months ago now. My guests are Suzanne Parker, the executive director of Girls Inc. of the Valley, Elena McCauley, who's the director of diversity and inclusion for the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass in Amherst, and Ziamara Di Lobato, who's the Associate Director of Diversity and Enrollment at UMass. We talk about many things, including racism's impact on young black and Hispanic women. Ladies, thank, thanks for being with us uh, on this edition of Even Better Western Mass. Uh, racism is, is a tough issue to talk about. It's an issue, though, that has plagued our nation since its inception. Uh, the existence of racism is often denied or minimized by society. Is it is it really systemic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I mean, I don't think there's really any way that we can talk about racism without understanding the systemic under underlyings of it. Um, you know, and I, I'm big on Twitter, so I, I tweeted this whole thing about just how, um, you know, living in our current society now, it's easy to say, oh, well, that's an individualistic experience or this is isolated in this one community but when you look at how policies laws systems have been implemented over time and we've never really rectified it it's quite easy to see how all of those um, systems of oppression have lended to what we see as modern day racism do you think one of the problems is the effects of racism aren't understood or appreciated uh, <laughs> What, what do you mean by not necessarily appreciate it or understand? Well, I, I, that w maybe not taken seriously enough by many people across the country. I guess I'd like to say, Dave, that I think part of that is about, you know, a sense of white privilege. I think as a white leader, I don't have to think about racism every single day because I don't experience that as a, as a white person. And so I think when you say, you know, people don't have, you know, maybe people aren't paying attention. I think that's probably white people that aren't paying attention or maybe aren't dealing with it. Um, again, uh, when, you know, uh, I, I, I guess that would be my response to, to that statement. Yeah, and I would have to agree. I don't necessarily think that it's um, people haven't seen what is going on. I think it's always been the people that have experienced it have been calling it out. It's just now that it's so public um, and we're able to see it on a very national scale um, through social media, through the news. news uh, it's, it's hard to ignore when it's right in your face. So um, I think that re most recently white people are becoming more awakened to what people of color, especially black and indigenous people of color have been saying for centuries. Do you think part of this is, is understanding the history of racism would help us better understand what's going on today? Absolutely. And also just being able to unpack just some of the, like literally unpack the impacts that racism has had on our communities from the start, you know, of founding the United States, or just this land, um, because it started then. And in my opinion, quite frankly, it's just modernized in the current time that we have been living in. So racism is still, can be, and still is, you know, equally as harsh or intense as it was, you know, years ago, it's just in a different format. You know, like modern day slavery is the pipeline to prison. And that's like a whole other topic that we can get into. But um, that's one thing that I think some, a lot of people, enlightenment is happening, but it's always been there. Like Elena, um, and Suzanne have already said, um, it's just a matter of now it's being spoken, it's being called out in so many ways, not just in person, but on social media, you know, in all digital forms, in like digital channels, etc. So um, I think that's something important to recognize that it's always been there. It's just modernized and it's a matter of how we're um, addressing that. And it takes, it takes an event, something happening to bring it to, to the forefront again. This is what 
quite honestly, being in the media has always bothered me that there seems to be a media cycle and there'll be an event and that media cycle will kind of run out after a month or six weeks or whatever. And then we just go back to business as usual. Is it different this time? I, I just get this feeling that we're, we can't go back to business as usual. I think it's different. I think it's very different. Um, there's a lot of tangibility out there calling out like systems and policies, legislature that literally have created these systems of oppression that can no longer be ignored in the workplace, in the classroom, in our neighborhoods that, you know, different policies that police um, just are living spaces. It's before there was a lot of call out to, you know, the acts that humans are, you know, enacting on each other. And now it's even, it's just on a much deeper, louder level that the, that the systems need to change. And the systems were created by humans, you know, so there's that. Right. Always imperfect systems when we're, you know, imperfect people and beings. I think, you know, to CEO's point, I think there's the difference between the call out, which we've consistently seen, versus now people are taking it from call out to accountability to action. Um, and I think that's one thing that, you know, as horrible as COVID has been and the pandemic has been, you know, we have no other option but to stay informed and, and stay, you know, reading about what's happening. And, um, you know, there's a little bit more opportunity to sit down and, and, you know, sign the petitions and things like that. And so I recognize that COVID has been devastating for communities of color, um, low-income communities and things like that. And so it kind of amplified everything that we've already been saying, but now it has also provided the stage um, to move from the media cycle, like you say, we, we hear a story, we see it. Now, how do we move from um, calling it out to uh, accountability and action? Let's talk about the impact of, of racism on, on young girls. Uh, girls Inc., I know you held a forum on, on the 17th, a, a racism town hall. Let's talk about the effects of racism on girls' self-esteem and confidence. Uh, I, I just can't imagine. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that girls are experiencing racism in their lives every day, and um, particularly black girls and girls of color and indigenous girls. Um, it could be something as little as being called out on dress codes in schools. And we hear that stories of girls in our programs where, you know, they're called out on a dress code issue. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, what's the reason for that? you look at the numbers disproportionately around discipline and um, you know, getting expelled from school. And while black girls may make a certain um, percentage of the population, they're, they're at a higher percentage or a higher rate disproportionately called out on those things. So um, we know it's impacting girls and just that daily, those, you know, that we call it that implicit bias. It's like somebody says, if you don't get one cut on your arm, okay, put a Band-Aid on it. But imagine a thousand cuts, a million cuts. And that's what it's like on those daily, um, you know, comments or those like slights that they're getting. Um, it really can create um, issues of, you know, mental health issues and challenges and self-confidence. Um, and we know girls are strong. They are strong and they are leaders. And so... Um, helping them find their voices um, through a town hall like this and getting an understanding of what some of those issues are is really important to us. I think Suzanne had such a good analogy about, you know, little, you know, cuts that we get. And I'm, you know, for me, I can speak for myself as a Latinx woman, you know, daughter to immigrant parents from south of the border and grew up in Springfield. I can absolutely say that it's very much like these little tiny jabs that you just consistently get over and over again. And sometimes for young girls, it just, and even young boys, but since we're focusing on young girls right now, like that feeling of just numbness, you just become, you just accept the fact, you know, that these stereotypes um, or all of these, you know, odd behaviors that people have towards you as a young child, are consistently happening and it's just the way it is. And that is where, you know, the mental health component and also just, you know, how that self-efficacy of our own belief um, of, you know, advancing in education, even just graduating high school in Springfield um, and, you know, pursuing anything beyond that 
is anything that that comes as a barrier um, a lot of that has been fueled by the societal racism, implicit biases, things that happen right in our local communities. And it truly does impact how we view the world and how we view our own place in the world. And that's where I do think it's our responsibility as educators, as community members, to start literally unraveling that and shifting the narrative. You know, and that's what's really important for our young girls so that the self-esteem continues to grow in a way that um, they feel that they are, you know, fierce, valuable. They bring so much to the table. They bring so much to the classroom and beyond. Um, so it does take work and it is and it can be detrimental. And it has been if we don't start addressing these issues and really working on them. How do we start? How do we start that? I think for young girls, um, also just recognizing the intersections, right? So I know CEO and, and Suzanne had already mentioned this, like girls in general, like we are always taught to be you know, a little bit more submissive. And it's like the implicit associations that we have and these biases that society has continued to infiltrate us with. And so once we recognize that there's also this additional layer of racism, microaggressions, um, you know, let's talk about sexual orientation and identity, religious affiliation, all of those things, in addition to being a young woman, um, can really be challenging. And so I think, you know, opportunities for girls to get involved with organizations like Girls Inc., where they're very much, you know, trying to push for that holistic development, holistic identity development, um, and recognizing their worth. I know it's incredibly important, like media imagery for my daughter, you know, eight years old, and came home because she watched Frozen a couple times and all her friends were blonde saying she wanted long blonde hair. And I was like, that's not in the cards for you, you know? And so I think it's, uh, it takes the parents to obviously have those conversations with kids, but I think it also takes a lot of work from community members, leaders um, to shift the narrative within, within those small communities. We've talked about this for hundreds of years. Um, I mean, so how do, how do we change it now? Um, uh, that, I guess that's the thing that, that, that I have a hard time understanding, that we seem to reach a certain point and then we seem to either fall back or just stop any progress in dealing with the issue of racism. Well, Dave, I have, I have to, oh, go ahead, Zio. Yeah. Uh, I was just saying that's a great question. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think it, it, it really relies on each and every one of us and the roles that we play to take a look at what systems and structures are we a part of that we have power to do something. So again, as a, as a white woman leading a nonprofit organization, I feel an immense burden and sense of, res not burden actually, like a sense of responsibility to take a look at what are the structures I, we have here in Girls Inc. even, you know, are there things we need to do to make sure that we are um, part of the solution and that we're addressing even institutional things that might be happening here. So. You know, who are our board of directors and who are um, our staff that are working with the girls? Um, the programming that we're doing with the girls, is it culturally appropriate? I mean, all of those things, you know, how do girls um, and families learn about us? How do they enroll in our programs? Are we making sure we're reaching all of the girls who really truly need access? So it really is the responsibility of each and every one of us. We've got to look at those bigger, broader systems. Um, we had a, uh, a data project with some of the Mount Holyoke College and other students, and I asked them to um, do some mapping and to find out where the redlined communities were. And I don't, I'm, Dave, you might have known what redlining is. It's literally they, wrote, they drew red lines around parts of the maps and said, banks, you don't want to give mortgages to people if they're going to try to buy a house in that, those communities. And it was no surprise to me that the very communities that most of our families in, are living in um, were communities that were not invested in, and they were in those red line communities. So, so if you're a family and you haven't been able to get a mortgage and you, know, you build up your family wealth, I mean, these are long systems of institutional racism that you know, still to this day, you can see the impact. There are some neighborhoods in, in, in Holyoke where you're going, gosh, you know, looks like it's had some hard times, could really use some investment. Well, guess what? Yeah, it's true because 
they, you know, in investors stayed away from them. You know, banks stayed away from that. And, you know, if you look at health, health disparities, it's in those same communities. Look at water quality. It's in those same communities. So I think it really behooves all of us to take a look at what are those things within our power to change? Look at voting and who's running for what and what they stand for, I think is really super important right now. So. Yeah. yeah, I think it, it takes also recognizing that it's not just organizations and institutions that we're a part of, but it's systems each one of us is upholding. You know, these things haven't just been created in any of our lifetimes, but we've continued to come into organizations and take on the same mentality in a lot of ways that we're going to, you know, insert band-aids rather than cure the disease. Um, and so I think it takes all of us to recognize that, you know, myself included, you know, there's a lot of systems that I've been a part of that, you know, status quo until you feel like you can say something or you're, you're a part of something bigger. Um, so it takes the awareness, absolutely, Suzanne, as she mentioned, you know, combating the, the, the small battles in the areas that you have the most influence, mm -hmm. but then also speaking out in the ones that you don't. Mm -hmm. And also, I just want to add to that as well, um, the importance, you know, Suzanne really mentioned this too, and like nailed it on how, you know, being a leader of this organization, it's a responsibility. And to be very honest, I mean, it really does start from the top down. You need your leaders that are, uh, you know, moving ahead with a specific cause and a direction to also have that higher sense of cultural competency and just societal awareness, economical like impact based on all of those things um, so that you can best prepare your team, whether it's a large organization, a small one, leaders need to be able to do that and understand. And if they don't, then there's a problem. So, and you know, and we're all, even myself, like part of these, systems and institutions that we do need to address that can perhaps like add to, um, you know, systematic um, or systems of oppression. And for my experience, for example, working in higher ed and college admissions, there's a lot of inequities that have happened um, in this industry nationwide. And we can start, you know, with the SATs and ACTs as a teeny little example that really does you know, cause inequity, literal disparity when it comes to, you know, racial and ethnic admission into higher education and gender based on, you know, male dominated industries. But I am proud that UMass Amherst is now going test optional. So I'll put that plug in there. <laughs> but that's like literally to address this issue. And it's been a long time, um, a long time coming. And it's about time, you know put it that way. So it requires that leadership and shift. Is the political climate in this country fueling this issue now, even, even more so than before? <laughs> That's a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say 100%. And it goes back to what I said, but just recently, it all stems from the leader, the head of the body is the one that navigates and moves um, everything else. And when you don't, when you have, you know, leaders in positions, leaders in positional, um, in excuse me, <laughs> leaders in positions of power, um, whether that's of the United States or of universities or big corporate businesses in the private or public sector, if there is this, um, notion of being okay with language that is discriminatory, racist, exclusive, classist, etc. Put all the isms in there. Then that's the message that you're condoning and you're allowing for, you're, you're letting people know it's okay to say this when it's not. So I would, my opinion, 100%. The political climate is fueling all of this in a way that is requiring others to take action. Um, and it's forcing, you know, others to really look into the systems that they're a part of, um, both on a national, you know, economical scale down to like local town, you know, uh, politics and being able to shift, you know, some of those opportunities around for communities. 
maybe this is naivety on my part. I, I, I look at my grandchildren, even my own children, uh, where they go to school, um, they are, are with black and Hispanic children. And at an early age, they're all playing together and having fun. Uh, and, you, and you look at them and go, racism isn't even playing a role in what they're doing. They're just kids having fun. Where does this all go south? Where does it change? Your point, like kids aren't raised or born like hating anybody, right? It's just like that level of comfort we have. We're, we're human beings, we're social beings. Um, so I think it starts coming once we recognize that there is a difference, right? You know, I, I think a lot of people like to say, um, you know, I don't see color or I don't see that. Well, then you're like literally saying, I don't see a part of you that makes you different. I'm not acknowledging that. And so, you know, when I, when I mentioned, you know, Frozen with my daughter, she was three years old at that time, you know, and it was something that somebody else had made more salient to her. And she started recognizing the differences within herself that she wasn't necessarily seeing other places, which made her, again, feel really low in her self-esteem. I ended up cutting off all my hair because I was like, hair doesn't matter. But, you know, at the same time, when you're not seeing media representation of people like you, you're saying, well, this is the dominant. And if you don't, you know, fit that dominant mold, then you are somehow othered or different. Um, and, and, you know, I think that goes across everything, right? We can easily say if you're only seeing, you know, um, a particular type of religion being celebrated in, in videos and movies, then you're going to say, well, my religion is different than that. How do I, you know, how do I fit into the society that I'm supposed to belong to? Um, and, and again, it's, it's cycled through all of that. And once people start having questions, I think the difference is that, you know, in white communities for a very long time, it was, we don't talk about race. We don't talk about things that make us feel uncomfortable because we don't want to acknowledge that there's difference. Whereas in other communities, it's like, let's celebrate, let's talk about our differences. Let's, you know, talk about how we can coexist and really build off of what makes each other stronger. And so I think, you know, especially like my generation and beyond or in older, you know, I think we were always taught, let's not bring this up. Let's not talk about it. And then it's like, well, why aren't we talking about it? We're seeing all these issues happening when we don't talk about it. So, um, you know, I think it happens pretty early on. It's just who's being counseled to address it in what way. I'll add also just the importance of representation. I think that's just, you know, something critical for children. They see and I'm saying this because, so I have a sister and um, I have my godson who's two, and I've never seen something like this happen where my, my sister and I were just hanging out and my godson was literally just copying everything that his mom did. Like, you know, not even putting out the words exactly that she was saying, but just copying body language, hand movement, pretending to be saying exactly what mom is saying. And I thought that was incredible. I've never seen that before. I don't have children of my own yet. Um, so like seeing my nieces and nephews grow up and then witnessing that spoke so much to me because our children are literally watching us. They're copying everything that we do. And that could, that's in the classroom, that's in daycare, that's at home, you know, which I, I, I mean, you know, a lot of us are at home and, you know, whether it's with parents, guardians, or just extended family, grandparents, which are a lot of caretakers nowadays. So it's all those things kind of like alluding to what Elena said, you know, representation is so important. The way that we are around our children, even if they're not our own in their family or they're like our friends' children or whoever, children are watching. They're watching everything that we do. They look up to us in so many different ways. And I think it's important for us to be very mindful about like being able to check ourselves when we are perhaps saying something that is not nice. Like if I know that my niece would call me out, she has in the past, one of them telling me, Thea, like that's not nice. Like you shouldn't say that. And sometimes our children just remind us that we need to just check ourselves, take a deep breath, and literally just be kind. So where does this starts obviously at home? How early? Well, you know, Dave, it's, I think what, what Ziomar is saying, it, which is so, it struck me, is that families can even be the best intentioned, right? And really right. think, oh, you know, I'm, 
I'm not racist and I, you know, I haven't, you know, I, I, I'm whatever it is and I'm, I'm supportive of my child's development. Just the story of my young daughter and it was more around gender um, than it was around race. You know, I'm the executive director for Girls Inc., right? We're about woman empowerment it, uh, inspiring girls to do, you know, non-traditional roles if they choose to. And I'll never forget my young, she might have been three years old, and she says, Mommy, only men build things. And I went, oh my gosh, I'm the executive director for girls. How do, you know, how do I raise a daughter? Well, and I thought about it. My father built his house. My brother built his house. So even though, you know, here I am, the executive director, and, you know, girl power, woman power, thinking about things that we can do, she was getting those subtle messages from everything around her. So Dave, yes, it starts at home, but I think even our homes, we're, we're, there are subtle messages they're getting that we just don't even realize. I remember not really wanting to push, um, you know, the hype of Christmas. We happen to celebrate the Christian holidays traditions. And I remember like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna keep her from that because I don't want her to get all stressed out and excited. Well, literally, all of a sudden, all she could talk about was that holiday. And I'm thinking, how is this possible? We have no, we, like, we have no media, we have no television, we have no, you know, the stuff in our house. Well, it's when you go out shopping, you know, you, huh. so young children, I mean, those are just examples. And again, not to do with race, but now imagine again, if you're, you know, a child, what are you, who are you seeing? You know, um, what are the messages you're getting in stores? Um, it, it just, it's, it, it's almost like they're absorbing their environment, right? It's, and I think we have to be so intentional. That's why at Girls Inc., for example, when we talk about the environment, you know, are there pictures of diverse girls and, and diverse even gender identities? And so people can see themselves. Is the curriculum and the programming inclusive of, of diverse groups of people? So. Um, it, it really is about intentionality and it starts young and, you, and it, it's happening and we don't even sometimes realize it until, uh, again, out of the mouth of a babe, right? And they say, you know, Tia, <laughs> you shouldn't say that or, or yeah. you know. Does it come down to this overall discomfort about us talking about this with our children? Oh, I, you know, early on, I tried to make sure I educated myself on, you know, raising a child around even just how to talk about race. And it was sort of, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, don't, don't, don't say that, don't say that. And, and as Elena was saying, that, that's a way of saying to your child, oh, you know, we don't, we don't acknowledge differences. Well, actually, kids acknowledge differences. They see differences. So I think there is a discomfort about race. It's one of the things, personally, I've been trying to work on is how, you know, how do we move into that discomfort and feel confident? We're not going to get it right all the time. We might make mistakes, right? Zio, our, our nieces are going to have to correct us. But I think we have to, we have to, we have to go fit right into those conversations with an openness to learn and to listen. And it's lifelong. This is a lifelong journey. It honestly isn't, it doesn't stop when we're children. Um, it happens until... <laughs> forever long, however long it takes. And it's, it's just a continuous journey of learning about ourselves, each other. And unfortunately, a lot of that is just the output of a really awful system that has really wired us to think in this way. So, you know, that patience, that willingness to learn uh, from each other. And when we talk about things that, you know, are different, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, all of these things, like they make these identities can make someone feel uncomfortable, which leads to that root, the root feeling of vulnerability, you know, of like being able to admit, I really don't get this, or, you know, please help me explain a little bit more. There's like, I don't know if it's like human ego, or just like not wanting to admit that you're not like fully aware, whatever those insecurities are, we as adults need to let go of that and be like, I am you know, I'm here, I want to listen, I want to learn, I may not know everything, but please, like, help me, like, let's have this conversation, and I take that from, you know, you know, as a Latinx lesbian woman in a very traditional, like, South American family, that's what it was with my parents, you know, being able, like, a very honest conversation, and they were like, Tiamara, we don't, 
you know, we support you. We don't know everything about the LGBTQ community, but we're willing to learn. So, you know, and unraveling that homophobia that was so embedded in, you know, my specific family. So it just takes work and it takes a willingness on both ends. Mm. Can I also say, like, I think it's to the point where, CEO, as you were mentioning, like with your family experiences, because they're not surrounded by people from a particular community, that can make you feel uncomfortable, right? The first time you, if you've only been surrounded by white people in your entire life, and the first time you're ever being told about race or seeing race or, or something like that, it might make you feel uncomfortable and you just have questions, but then you're already being told you can't ask them right? So granted, it should always be respectfully at least, but, um, you know, so like if you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable already in an environment that you're a part of and you don't have the tools uh, to communicate how you're feeling or to understand or to interpret what you're seeing, that's only going to lend to that discomfort. And obviously you're not going to be able to progress from there. So. Sure. So we have to learn how to deal with that discomfort Mm -hmm. and move on from it. Being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Exactly. You know, as you, as you look at this, uh, you know, we talked about this early on, the fact that this has been going on for generations, for, uh, for hundreds of years, and realize that this is not going to change overnight. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow progression, and I guess that's the unfortunate thing, that we can't snap our fingers and have this change right away. But it can be. I am a strong believer that racism and all of these other forms of oppression can be eradicated, and there are ways to do it, and I think... You know, that's another shift of narrative that we have to start believing because there is this other narrative that racism will never go away. It's just part of culture, just part of how we were founded. Part, you know, so there's all of these other, you know, notions of justification that things are the way they are and it is what it is and we just have to keep fighting for the rest of our lives. And I, part of that, I believe like, yes, you know, there's truth and there's like, a lot there but i also believe that it can be unraveled in our entire and every single system it just requires that work the leadership involved like you know making those changes and impacting and it takes time but i really believe it can be done i too i feel like i've i've definitely shifted (laughs) my mentality over the years um, one, because I, I'm obviously embedded in diversity, equity, and inclusion work with my, my career. Um, however, you know, I think that the first time I ever got hope that we can eradicate racism and systems of oppression has honestly stemmed through COVID. You know, seeing a nation and a world shift so many things overnight, essentially. Yeah. You know, we are, you know, we're homeschooling our children across the nation. We are, you know, staying inside. We're moving to more um, inclusive practices, honestly, just in terms of our media access and outlets. And we shifted to a new normal. I mean, in some places, they, they moved pretty quickly back. But um, again, I think that speaks to that level of discomfort when it's something so new and it's a society that you've never been able to see or dream of. Um, that's going to cause some tension. And so now when we're seeing how, you know, we've had to make these changes with COVID, And we can literally snap our fingers and say, this is what's going to happen, even though it's not something we ever thought would happen, or some people did. Um, You know, how are we going to be able to do the same thing with with racism? And I think it comes down to, again, the visual representation of how all these people are coming together saying this is an issue. It's a public health crisis as well. You know, all of these cities and communities are stepping up and making a stand. You know, I, I feel really hopeful knowing that that's a that's an area that we can continue to improve. Yeah, but, I agree. I think it feels like for the first time, the discussion really is about gaining an understanding about the institutions and the structures, and that there actually are proposals on how things can be changed or things that need to be done that can address some of the inequities uh, um, that have built up over years and generations. So. I, I'm ex- I, I think it's, it's, again, it's hard work. It's not going to happen overnight, but there's some really exciting people out there doing a lot of education. And I think as a way, <laughs> people are home, you know, and we have social media and there's a lot of information on what, well, what, does, what does implicit bias mean? I think people are learning about that and hearing more stories about that. I think 
Um, what is institutional racism? I think people are educating themselves during this time. At least that's what I'm sensing. Yeah. Really hopeful. Well, ladies, my Zoom clock tells me we have less than a minute here, unfortunately. Uh, thank you all for taking part. And I, I must say, after talking with all of you, uh, you give me hope um, that things can be better. And hopefully it will be in the not too distant future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. I appreciate, you know, the platform that you're even sharing with, you know, three women from very different backgrounds and experiences to, to really talk about ways that we can make Western Mass better. My thanks to Suzanne Parker, Elena McCauley, and Xiomara Dilabato for being my guests this week on Even Better. We hope that our conversation gives you a better understanding of racism and the challenges faced by millions of Americans each and every day. My thanks to all of you for joining us. Hope you'll join us next week for Even Better Western Mass. Have a good week.